What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan on this uh, kind of somber Tuesday night. Uh, I'm sure we were hoping to, you know, be celebrating a big win uh, for the Bills, but uh, Ryan, it just did happen for Buffalo Monday night. Tough one, um, but glad you have your power back. Yeah, I so if my power went out uh, with probably about 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, which appears to be for the best. And apparently my apartment, because I've never lost power here before, doesn't get service without Wi-Fi. So I couldn't look at anything either. So I was just sitting in a dark apartment waiting for power to come on. Didn't come on to one. Why I stayed up to one, I don't know. <laughs> Only to be sad and without electric. And so it it was a mess of a night, man. I'm just sad. And we were talking before the show about this, but it just, it fucking sucks. I thought New England, we could enjoy New England being bad. I talked a lot of shit about New England this year, this offseason. And there was a point, and I, I remember it so vividly in this season, that they were down uh, two scores to Houston. And I was like, this is amazing. This team is terrible. And they're fucking back. They're just back. It's like a... a they're like the Twinkie in the nuclear nuclear uh, winter. They just don't go away. They're like cockroaches. You cannot kill them. It, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I haven't like you know admitted that I think Mac Jones is better than what I thought he would be as a rookie. But I agree with you. It just sucks that like, you know, we had one year of sort of really seeing like what it's like to be kind of the only team in the division. I mean, last no one was close to competing. I mean, well, I guess I mean the Dolphins, but you know, still though. I mean, the Bills were sort of that squad in the AFC East, and that was very short lived to say the least. Because you know, I mean, right now, I mean, this division is, I mean, is looking like it's probably going to be New England's yet again for the millionth time. It feels like we, you know, over the last kind of two decades. But the one thing Ryan and I know, because you and me are also talking how like on Twitter, it's just been kind of crazy. And it usually is after a loss, but this has been particularly something, I guess you could say, after this game. And everyone's kind of like trying to like blame like everybody. Like, is there I, who do you blame? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious. Like, who 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 does this locket get put on? Just because I, I for, I've seen people saying McDermott, Dable, the running game, the O line, the D, like who who like gets the finger pointed at them ultimately in this game? Because I I don't know. I I, I want to say the front end. I think we all forgot how to handle disappointment. Because this really feels like the first time in the McDermott Bean regime where they are playing below themselves. This really feels mm -hmm. like the first time. And expectations have a huge role in that, right? But this is the first time, you know, since the drought. Because even, you know, that, that 2018 season, you know, I, I think fans were very self-aware about what that team was. In that 2017 season, peep team peep, we were very self-aware. And then 2019 was a surprise. 2020, I don't know if I'd call it a surprise, but was I'll call it a surprise. Dominant surprise. They lost three games in that year. And now we're, even though we're seven and five in, in drought years where that it, it's still in the playoff spot in drought years where that would be celebrated. We don't really know how to handle that. It, you know, it, it's really been five years. Since we've kind of had this feeling in our stomach. So I, I, I think that's where a lot of this emotion is coming from, and rightfully so. However you want to mourn, that's on you. Do, do, but just don't be a dick, unless it's the Jerry Sullivan, like I said. Sorry, <laughs> I, I don't know if we should cut that out or not, but he's also – nah, we'll leave it in. Um, we'll leave it in. Anyways, sorry, that was a really long diatribe <laughs> to get to the your question, which was, who do I blame? And there's so much blaming going to this coaching staff, and people want to indict McDermott. People want to indict Dable. Let's talk about what really went wrong. This was a three, a four-point football game, a one-score game. The Bills are one and four in the in, in one-score games this year, and it's execution, right? We can talk about the plays that were called. We can talk about what should have been called here, what should have called there. Three drops from Dawson Knox that changed drive that stopped drives. Number one, Stefan Diggs. We said in the pregame show that. This is where he's got to step up. And this is an indictment of Stefan Diggs. He's still an elite receiver who makes that catch 99 times out of 100.
but he drops that pass that Josh Allen threw beautifully through the wind. And I understand that's a tougher catch because of the wind. I wasn't in the stadium, so I don't know what the trajectory on that ball was or what it looked like. But you got to catch that, like period. You catch that game, we're not, we're not talking about that, right? The execution for me is where this game starts. Shooting themselves in the foot. Hole, you know, a necessary hold from Spencer Brown early in that game. False starts that pushed them back. A fumble that didn't need to happen. You know, it's, it's John McDermott, Brian Dable aren't out there to make sure the, the handoff goes in the exact right spot so they don't fumble it, right? They're not out there to 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 do some of these things that the Bills just as players could not you know, just just fail to do in this game. So that's where it really starts for me. And we can get into coaching in a second, but I. I I, I don't know how good of coaching could have overcome some of those mistakes in that weather yesterday. So I kind of wrote something very generic that I'm kind of like categorizing, I guess I could say for, for, for as far as who I am blaming for this. Okay. So for me, I think that this is blame that goes around to everybody on this team, players and coaches included. I don't think that you can necessarily isolate one position group, one side of the ball, coaches or players. I think that everybody made mistakes in this game that really cost this team. All right. I'll start with the players because that's kind of where you went. And that's a lot of what I said. And I kind of just said it just uncharacteristically undisciplined. And I don't need that as far as just like penalties and just in general, the drops, the missed tackles, right? There were some killer penalties that really hurt this team. Um, you know, you had guys not filling their gaps. You know, McDermott's talked about that, a gap integrity. We saw that long touchdown run. Dotson and, and Edmonds were not in the right position, and it let it sprung that run open. And I think, so I do think that does come down to execution. Like you said, it's just the players are not executing at the level they should be. And on top of that, I think some of it, Ryan, is, you know, people have been talking about, are the Bills soft? And I don't like saying a team is soft because these, are, these guys are all football players. They play some of those brutal physical sport that you can play and I do think there are guys on this team that are absolutely physical guys I mean our quarterback will truck people over stiff arm guys jump over you right like that like Alan's not a soft guy but I have said I wrote this down I'm curious what you think I said I because I, I think Ryan that this offensive line and defensive line are certainly lacking physicality I don't think there's any question about that after watching the Colts game after watching this game where those two teams they are they thrive on being physical up front and it's now been in those two games where either both lines they never kind of match that level of physicality and whether you want to call that soft or not I'm not sure but I'm just calling it that they just lack physicality on the line of scrimmage no I I think you're absolutely correct and you know I think that this team you know the way that this offensive line was built they just they don't have a lot of nastiness on that line right none of those guys are you know you look at new england and they're all guys who just want to get downhill and, and get to the next level and hit dudes and that's just not how this team is built maybe outside of spencer Brown, and they just don't have the guys to play the type of football that maybe makes them want the you know that that makes it easier to run in this game when you have you know daryl williams who's Played decent to guard, but you know that's not what he was playing last year. And and either Ike Bacher or John Feliciano or Cody Ford, whoever you have on the other side, just not built for that style of football and and built for games like yesterday. And and I think what's frustrating and what gets into I think the coaching side of this is just they bashing your head against the wall with things that don't work. And I get it to a degree with the weather the way it was. I didn't know how that wind was going to affect the passing game. I didn't know who's going to be a game where you needed to run. So early on, I understood running, right? But as soon as Josh, I mean, even going the other way, Josh wasn't having a that hard of a time throwing the football. So just, it feels like they kept trying to, use this weakness of theirs in this game because we that Patriots defensive line are four or five dudes who are massive, physical, and just not a good 
on the other side, not a good matchup for this offensive line. Barmore, gotcha. Judon are all just massive humans who can beat you up real bad. And it just felt like the Bills were playing into that. And instead of, you know, letting Josh and, and letting him throw it once he proved that he could throw the ball downfield and that he, why we drafted him, right? So he could, we could use that arm to throw through crappy weather. It just, that is where it gets into is like, I felt like a lack of self-awareness of the, the miscues on the field. Well, and I think that, cause again, like I said, I sort of categorized my blame and I did write some things for coaches. I think that's kind of where you, I sort of lead off with the coaches and I'm looking mostly at the offense for this one is that's kind of the thing. Like this team wasn't really built to be exactly a power run team. Now, I'm not saying that they should be incompetent and incapable of doing that, but let's be real. This was a team that was built to, you know, spread offense, you know, spread it out and throw the football. So that's where I sort of sort of questioned this coaching staff a little bit, because if you wanted to run the ball, that's okay. Like, I'm not anti-running the football, although I do think that this team's clear strength is throwing it. The wind's crazy, and I understand that's going to cause some complications. But the thing that was driving me crazy was there was no creativity in the run game at any point in this game yesterday. I mean, I wrote it down, Ryan. The Bills did not have a single design run for Josh Allen in this game. They only had one designed run to the outside edge which was given to Brita. Otherwise, every single run in this game was a handoff to Singletary or Moss that went straight in between the tackles. And that is, you know, heavy package on the field. Like, it just, I feel like the Bills were trying to kind of jam uh, a square peg into a round hole with that game plan a little bit, just because I get that the weather's going to be, you know, how it is. But part of the advantages of having a spread offense is that you get people out of the box, giving your running backs more lanes to get through. And this team just doesn't have the personnel, I think, to line up like the Patriots can with six alignment, a full back, big people ready to move guys, because that's just not how they're built. And I just thought it was really, frankly, stupid for them to think that they could line up like that and run it over and over again in those formations where not only is that not really how they're built, I mean, we haven't seen that out of the Bills in years, like that kind of football. And I just think that that was a really bad miscalculation on, I don't know if that was McDermott. I don't know if that was Dable. I'm not going to like try to blame one or the two because let's be real. I don't know who the hell was exactly responsible for that, but I just think that that's just, you know, yes, the weather is what the weather is, but you, you got to stick to your identity on offense, which is, which is throwing the ball and, and spreading it out. And I just think that the Bills went to such a far extreme away from what they are as an offense that they just really handcuffed themselves so badly in this game. Lean into what you do well. Lean into what you are as a team. And you're right. It's a passing team and not. I think that's where the frustration comes from coaching. It's just, if it's not there, don't do it, man. Like, if if you have to be a team that throws it all the time because you don't have a run game, do that. Right. People say, well, you have to be multidimensional. The Patriots weren't multidimensional. They ran it more than any team's ever run it since 1942. It wasn't 1942. It was 1970 something. But it really just if you got to pass it 60 times a game, pass it 60 times a game. That's not me being hyperbolic. You got to do what you got to do to win. And I know there's a pushback again to this idea. You know, Mitchell Schwartz has been loud about this on Twitter that. You know, offensive linemen need this, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, offensive linemen, you know, thrive on run calls and offensive line. And, I, and I've seen some of that stuff and read some of that stuff that, you know, offensive linemen really appreciate it. And it helps, you know, the cult, the, you know, just the, the morale of the game, being able to run and being able to run successfully. But if that's just not part of your offense and that's not something you do well, you, you got to do what it is that you do well and especially when you have a quarterback as uniquely talented as Josh Allen. And, you know, I, I do think it's inexcusable not to in those, you know, those four red zone trips, not to call some Josh Allen runs specifically in those spots where he's proven so successful in those situations. And that is where I understand the frustration. And that is why I understand why people will be mad with this coaching staff. But there is one thing 
that I'm not blaming in this game. And that's defense, man. I, I think there's a lot of pushback on this defense. And, and there were some miscues in the run game as well. But, you know, I, I think it, it was, I forgot who put it on Twitter. But he, the the Patriots, yeah, they had 223 rushing yards. But that was all of their yards. They had 4.6, you know, yards per carry. If If you had 46 pass completions for 200 yards, that would look a lot different, right? That would be discussed a lot differently. The Bills defense held them the 14 points, and it's clear that, you know, Mc, uh, Belichick did not want to put this game in the hands of Mac Jones. He was running on third and 13. He was, he was not, he did not want to put that game in Mac's hands. And this defense did everything they needed to do, uh, you know, some big rushes in there included to, to, keep this team in this game and they you know they had they had two they had two opportunities to win this game at the end even with the drops even with everything they had two opportunities to win this game at the end and one one more coaching and the only other real coaching issue I had was I really think that first two-point conversion they should have gone for it I, I think that was a big moment right there and I remember sitting there thinking, ah, those points might come back because, you know, if, if they have that point, I think that game gets played a little bit differently, right? If they have that point, they can go down in the third quarter and kick a field goal, right? They can go down and kick a field goal to tie. It's a different game. That uh, You know, the biggest issue in this game is that they just never had the force Mac Jones to do anything. And it really is, you know, for me, it's number one execution, number two coaches. And that's where, it, and that's really where the blame is for me in this game. Yeah, I I do agree with you a little bit with the defense. I, I I am getting concerned though that this is now yet another game where when teams are just physical and have that physical run game, how that is definitely the Achilles heel of this defense. Um I know this the defense is still a great defense, but like they have that that's clearly the one way that you can get them. And I, as much as yes, like they did hold them to, you know, only like 240 yards of offense and 14 points, which if you told me that going into the game, I would have thought the Bills probably would have won. Um, I just think that I would have liked them to just be a little bit better on first and second down. The Patriots were in second and third and shorts, you know, less than five, basically quite a bit in this game. And if they're running the ball, like you got to just kind of really kind of jam it eventually and get them into some third and longers where if they run it, fine. They're not getting the first down. If they throw it, they throw it. I just think I would have liked the defense to really had to put the Patriots and Mac Jones in some tougher positions throughout the game, but you're being, but you're right, Ryan. At the end of the day, they held them to 14 points and played a good enough game to win. I don't think it was their best game, but it was not. It wasn't the Colts game a few weeks ago. It wasn't that Titans game from early in the season. Like the defense did enough to win, and that's what it comes down to. Is this offense, especially? I mean, at the end of the day, those first two possessions when you have the ball at your own 48 and the Patriots 40 to come away with zero points. That was the killer, I think, in this game. That, that to me, was a killer um, and kind of set the tone. So I, I just think that, you know, ultimately, I think this game, you do have to put it a bit more on the offense, players and coaches in this one, just because the offense really was so out of rhythm and just never, never, ever had anything going the whole night. And I, and I think that really transitions well into – some of these comments that were after the game for this team, because we McDermott never gives us a ton good or bad, but this was the first time I really felt like McDermott <clears throat> gave us some things of note in his post game presser. And I think what you just touched on is a great way to segue because he talked about that when that controversial that I really don't think is actually that controversial or, or a knock at Bill Belichick, but that, that he made that note that the Bills, on average, I think he said we're starting at like the 42 or 43 yard line as opposed to the 23 yard line, and that's the recipe for success. You know, they, the, the, the all things considered, the defense was putting them in positions to to score points. So it's you know you have some of these quotes after the game, and I guess the first thing that really sticks out to me is where is this offense going to go from here? Because it seems like in those post game comments and his frustration that he never, never 
publicly airs frustration. This frustration with the offense, he publicly airs. And I, I'm very curious to where this offense goes from here and what, you know, we, we're not going to use this space or maybe you want to use this space, but I don't think this is probably the time to maybe discuss Stable's future. But I, I think there's a clear disconnect. I think that's the buzzword today, mm-hmm. right? Disconnect in this offense between Stable and uh, Sean McDermott. Is is there is there anything else from that press conference that really kind of was unique? Because there was a couple of notes in that press conference that I think really – kind of made people's ears go up or spidey senses tingle or whatever whatever euphemism you want to use yeah well i'll I'll start with that comment like you said where he kind of you know talked about dable a little bit and again we don't you know we'll not get i don't think we should get too crazy into it just because we are where we are right now and i think discussing coaches futures you know you can we, we can discuss that at the end of the season once this all plays out but i do think that mcdermott and dable something doesn't seem right And I don't know if it's McDermott's getting too involved in the offense because McDermott has been adamant about establishing the run. And last year, McDermott wasn't so much involved in the offense. That was when they were dominating teams, chucking it through the air, throwing it 30, 40 times a game, you know, down the field. Um, So I don't know if it's that. I don't know if Dable has reverted back to kind of what we saw in his first two seasons where fans weren't so happy with how the offense was looking before Josh Allen sort of ascended into this quarterback that we've seen. So I, I don't know who has sort of been the cause because the, the set I saw that stuck out to me, Ryan, when, when you talk about as far as like where, where the Bills have gotten at this point, because those first six games before the bye, you know, their, their defense was allowing only 16 points a game. The offense was averaging 33. And the six games post by the defense is still only allowing 16 points per game. I think it's actually identical, 16.3 points per game. The offense is down to like 22 points per game. I mean, they've reverted big time, really regressed. I mean, you know, back to, again, what we kind of saw from this offense before 2020. So I don't know who's, which coach is sort of causing that regression that we've seen the last month and a half. Um, But that, that stuck out to me. And also what he said about McKenzie and Stevenson sort of stuck out to me because I've never heard McDermott ever say, you know, we didn't trust you know, basically not trusting his players. He's always been a guy that has put full faith in his players, especially guys that are, you know, either, you know, draft picks of his or, or guys that are kind of Mr. Processes, if you will. And I think McKenzie and Stevenson both are guys that would fit, you know, draft pick from Stevenson. McKenzie's always kind of been about the process. And I, 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 I don't, I'm not saying I disagree with those two being inactive. I just have never seen him flat out say, I don't, I didn't trust them. And, you know, this is a game where it felt like they could have used speed. This is a game where I feel like they maybe could have used some, you know, flip of field. And to have them both inactive, you know, whether it's McKenzie or Stevenson, to have them both inactive and that kind of speed on the sidelines just feels like a poor allocation of resources. You know, mm-hmm. they, there's some, you know, I know we had Brita active, but there had to have been something that they could have done something different. They could have done, you know, they, they, they forced the Patriots to punt a ton. Could they have gotten some yards back? Could have they flipped that field position a little bit? I like to think maybe even, you know, as much as I beg them, McKenzie, maybe even, you know, someone to do something to just in a game where you knew yards were going to be a premium, an absolute premium. It, it, it is a weird look for him in that situation. Because, you know, we've talked about what Micah Hyde is a returner. He's just a safe returner who can catch it, can protect it, but he's not what you would call an explosive returner. So it, it that is what, they'll, you know, if you ask me where I blame coaching, it's there, you know, it's there. And it's the, the things we discussed before. And I, this feels like maybe more so than any other point in the season. Because I feel like we've had this conversation a couple times now where they go from here. This feels like the crossroads right here for this team. There's five games left. If you go three and two, one more against the Patriots, one more against the Bucks, and you have Panthers, Falcons, and, and Jets. Jets. So you go 10 and seven. It looks like that probably gets the bills in with a little bit of help. You, you got to steal one of them here. And this really feels like a crossroad. What is this team going to become 
what is is this team going to keep doing the same thing, hoping for the same result? Is they going to keep? Or are they going to try something new? You know, take a risk on something. I think that's really the big question, and I think so. Maybe given some of those comments, maybe we see some some change. You know, we've seen changes. You know, with kick return and some other things. You know, Matt Frieda. So I'm curious if we see any bigger changes going down the road. That that very well could be. And this, real, like you said, Ryan, I mean, sure, going into this game against the Patriots, you know, this was sort of, okay, win, you got the division, you're kind of back into that, like, one C area, you know, lose, you're, you're a wild card team. But you're right. I mean, the way things are shaking the AFC, like, listen, the Bills are going to have to be the Bucks on the road or New England on the road because 10 and 7 is no guarantee you're making it this year. I mean, the Bills are – kind of at that position where they're sort of fighting uh, just for just to be in it. Um, and kind of just quickly going back to McKenzie and, and Stevenson, I think this is sort of what I was saying with the, like the creativity in the run game. Like you said, having that speed. I mean, we how many times have we seen as far as McKenzie as an offensive weapon? They do that jet sweep and he takes it, he, you know, rips off the big one. And all of a sudden it kind of gets people going a little bit. I mean, that's all. I mean, that was the difference with the Patriots of this game is they, they ripped off a big play. So, Kind of going back to what you're saying, though, you're right. This, 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 something's going to have to change with this, and I think in particular with this offense, because at the end of the day, they have just far too much talent to be playing the way they're playing. They have way too good of a quarterback, too, too many good receivers to be only averaging, you know, 22 points a game and only be scoring 10 points when you're at home. That's got to have to change, or else this team's going to find themselves in some real trouble as we get really close to the playoffs because it's, it's put up or shut up time now, Ryan. I mean, like you said, it's five weeks left. The, the AFC has got like 13 teams who are like legitimately in the playoff race. Like it's going to be a dogfight and the Bills need to be ready for it because this is the first, I think this is the first time, Ryan, in, in, in the McDermott and B era where they are facing real legitimate adversity at its finest because they've always sort of been the Cinderella, the underdog, that kind of we didn't expect you to be here, but their backs are against the wall. It's the first time really in five years, that, like you said, they've really been below expectations. Yeah, it, it, this is, you know, this is where you make your money. It, it's what, what are you going to be from this point on out? But we're going to talk about that in a second. Before we get there to put the final bow on this game, what, when you look back at this game, where where's the point? Where's our turning point in this game? Where's the point where you think, you know, the point of no return, the thing where, where things really could have gone different, where things really went downhill. Where, what's the, ter- where did this go wrong for Buffalo? I mean, you could point to a lot of things, but I'm kind of going to, I'm going to point to the, I think the final nail in the coffin for this game for me, where I officially said we are screwed. And it was that last time the Bills were in the red zone where they had it first and goal, I think from like the seventh. I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was like the 11. It was something like that. They were they were inside the 15, and they go incomplete pass, sack, false start, incomplete pass, and I think that was on the Dawson Ox drop of the end zone, followed by a Tyler Bass missed field goal. To me, that was just sort of the epitome of this offense. What it's been like the last couple of weeks was just self-inflicted wound. You had the offensive line protection break down. We've seen that a bunch. You had... Uh, you know, guy, you know, drop a ball. We are starting to see that a little bit, right? You had a penalty, a pre-snap penalty, where in a game where every yard really counted. We've seen this offense get a lot of penalties recently. And then on top of it, yes, I get it. It was a you know a, a, a long third down that the, or fourth down that Bills had to make, but I don't know if I would have kicked that field goal there, right there, down by four. How many times you get into the red zone? I wouldn't mind the Bills throw it and maybe try to get a PI or something or let Allen use his legs which we've seen McDermott kind of revert back to his more conservative nature and, and haven't seen him get back to that aggressiveness we saw back in 2020. So for me, that was sort of the moment where I think the Bills had their last glimmer of hope and they kind of blew it just sort of like you could say with this game. For me, I said the third quarter because <clears throat> they had the ball, they were getting the ball back and it just really seemed like if they were going to get offense going, they end up moving the ball well in the fourth quarter too, but that was the spot because you knew, you knew that that was where you could bank your points in that game or where it felt like you could bank your points in that game. And they just, 
They refused to. They just they didn't take advantage of that opportunity and made it harder for themselves to come back in that fourth quarter. And just not coming away with a touchdown or anything in that quarter is just absolutely devastating. And it, it you know, I, I think really that's where I felt. That's where I started to feel like that game turned. And when they couldn't score there and, you know, they punted with, I think, about six minutes left. And then essentially the Patriots ran the clock out on that quarter almost. And that, that for me, that was really where I felt that game starting to slip away, even as they had some drives that went further, you know, that, that, that went into the red zone after that. But who was in a game that was real stinky? Who was your MVP? I think that I'm going to have to go with Josh Allen in this game, because I think that he showed you as far as him throwing the football. Listen, that was, a big reason why you drafted him, right? Being able to throw in very bad conditions. And he showed it that he could throw it. And not only throw it, he threw some pretty damn accurate passes game. I get it. He had a few that got a little away from him. But that's going to happen when the wind's 35, 45 miles an hour whipping across the stadium. But Josh Allen made some big-time throws. I mean, especially that deep ball to digs that, that you know, was almost a touchdown. I mean, I, I don't think... I think that was one of the best throws I've ever seen that guy attempt in, in his career. I know it was an incomplete pass, but it was that impressive. And he was the one guy in the offense I felt the whole game was bringing it and was on his game and was doing what he had to do, whether it was running, throwing, whatever it might be. And I just wish that looking back on it, they, they, they put the, the, the game in his hands a little bit more because it seemed like when he did throw it, he ended up faring pretty well. So I, I think Josh Allen for me is my MVP just because he nearly willed him to a victory himself really in this game. Yeah, that, that's who I have too. I don't, I don't really have anyone different than that because of, because of that. He was the only one, he, he was that offense and he, when he gripped the ball, he, he showed the ability to throw for all this stink we give him. You know, I, one of the things that I felt maybe was a fair criticism. It was his inability playing the in, in poor weather, but he showed up to do his job and the, the play calling didn't let him. His wide receivers didn't help him. And you know, that was really a, why they lost that game. Who now for one, you have a lot of choices to pick from who was your right. LP? This is probably the popular choice, but I have to go with it. And I hate to do this because he's become one of my favorite Bills this season, but Dawson Knox was terrible last night. I don't think there's any way to put it. He had two catches and three drops, and two of his drops came on third down, and the other drop came in the, in the end zone. I know some of them were hard catches, but in a game like that, when everything is on the line for your team, effectively, I mean, we're talking division, we're talking one seed, where everything that you want, when, when this season started, the Bills had everything in front of them still with this game. And he, he, I mean, he, he killed three drives single-handedly. And I, I think that, for me, I just have to put him on this list just because his, his this was the worst game he's played all year, and it's really not even close. Yeah. Uh, I knew I the go a little bit different, I think, for me, is I'm just going to go with, with uh, I think Tremaine Edmonds didn't show up in this game. Yeah, we, we've been Tremaine Edmonds defenders in this game. And this is a game where you really needed his traits to show up and you really needed his intelligence to show up and you really needed his football IQ to show up. And it, it didn't. And it, that is, you know, I think one of the things that was most disheartening about this as someone who's really thought he stepped up this year in a big situation where you knew they were going to run and you knew they were going to run at you. And he did not provide a ton of help. And he wasn't necessarily, you know, a negative. He was just kind of another guy out there. And and that really stinks. And that's one of the, really the gut punches in this game for me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I and like you said, you could have picked a, a whole bunch of other guys. But, yeah, this was a game where, I mean, Evans ultimately kind of regressed a little bit back to what what his critics have said about him, you know, is, oh, he's got all these abilities. Where Where are the plays? I mean, at the end of the day. Milano was the guy who made the flash plays from that linebacker position. But, you know, this team's 7-5, to five, Ryan, right? Like, that, like I, I think fans, you know, we, we have to kind of accept it, right? Like, this is who they are. This is where they are. And this is, 
what it's going to be, right? They're seven and five. They're currently, I believe, the seventh seed of the playoffs for today. So the last possible wild card team in. Um, I think we need to kind of just be honest here a little bit and and really think about what really are the expectations for this team moving forward. You know, that's kind of a question that's being tossed around. And you and me have both said it, like, hey, this is, you know, well, this could be a Super Bowl team. We we've, we've been firmly believing that. Have your expectations for this team now officially changed? I think this is a team that is you have to change to instead of let's go win and dominate is let's get in and hope we get hot. You know, I, I think that's where you are with this team. And I, I do still think that this is a team that can win a Super Bowl, right? We've seen teams get hot. You know, I, I'm not going to do, I promised myself I wasn't going to do the, well, the Bucks were 7-5 and five last year. I'm not going to do that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they're still in the driver's seat. They control their own destiny for this playoff spot. They still, even with with the, some of the issues that, that have shown up, have a really, really good defense, even without Trey White on this team. And this is a team where, as a whole, we know Sean McDermott is a good coach. And they have the recipe, right? They there's they have the recipes to ignite. They have the recipe to to catch fire. And I think that's what you gotta hope for now, right? I, I think that I'm not, you know, am I less hopeful for a Super Bowl? Absolutely. You know, that is my confidence in the season law, you know, lower? Absolutely. But this is still the same roster that not just Bills fans, experts, media, you know, media members, you know, national media members pick to go to the Super Bowl this year and pick team people pick to win the Super Bowl this year. So those pieces are still here. The key pieces that we need, the elite players are still here. It's just putting it together. So I'm still confident that this is a playoff team. I think that I, I believe that this is a team that can steal one of these next, you know, they got to steal one for us to really feel good about it, right? Steal one against the Bucks or the Patriots, and I think they can if they can, if they can go four and one down the stretch here. I'll I'll feel a lot better. So for me, as far as my expectations, they definitely have. Um, I guess you could say changed a little bit. Um, I agree with you, Ryan. I think that this is a team that if they hit their groove at the right time. They could go to a Super Bowl and maybe even win it. I don't. I don't doubt that because I do believe they are a Super Bowl talent wise. They're, they're, they they have the talent to get to a Super Bowl and win it. But I also got to kind of look at what this team's been putting on the field the last six weeks because this is, hasn't been a two to three week kind of slump. This has been six weeks now of just looking just sort of sluggish and lethargic outside of the Jets and the Saints. You know. Like, they haven't really been playing very well. And the issues that we – it feels like every week, we keep on talking about some of the same sort of issues that we're seeing. So I'm starting just to get a little concerned that, you know, maybe this is not the team we thought it was. I'm not saying that they can't win the Super Bowl, but I think that we came in this year thinking that this is a team that's going to run teams over, trounce the AFC East easily, be up in contention for that one seed all the way to the end, especially after that, you know, that cheat Sunday night game. I mean, we, I mean, Bill fans were thinking we were going to win the super, win the super right then and there. And it's kind of been a little bit of a fall from grace to say the least from that, from that game. So do I think this is a playoff team? I do. I think when it's all said and done, they'll get it together and they're going to get into the playoffs just because I think they're too talented, too good not to be in the playoffs, but I don't really know this is a division winner at this point. I don't I don't really know where this team's gonna go in the playoffs just because they've sort of just been all over the place the whole season. So as much as I still think they could win a Super Bowl, I don't know if I'm expecting them to really be that team in the AFC so much anymore, just because we're seeing some teams starting to, I think at this point, you know, teams like the Chiefs and at this point maybe even the Patriots kind of showing, hey, I you know, these might be your your front runners to go to to win this AFC. Yeah. And and I, you know, I, I've conceded in my head that, you know, this division's probably out of hand. I do think it's of note or to make note that, you know, if they can catch fire and they win out, you know, they, 
they can win the division if they win out, right? They'll they'll have another game against the Patriots. They have a tie if they if they split with the Patriots, they'll have the tiebreaker. And and you know, I, I think this is a team that's one and four in one score games. Last year they were or maybe it's 0 and, 0 and 4 in one score games. Last I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. One I think they are one and four this year. I believe. And but last year they were four and zero or five and zero in one score games. So you know that that's one of those things where it's a little bit of a correction, right? You know, some it, one score games and are is normally something that's not something that's repeatable or something that is a little random when it comes to football it, or statistically that it shows us. So you know, if I'm confident that you know maybe that finally flips, maybe they get some luck in some of these games coming up. You know, really the two big games coming up and the big one coming up here is the defending Super Bowl champions on Sunday back on Sunday after two weeks off of Sunday and a team that also you know I said I wasn't going to do the comparison but now we're talking about them so I will but a team that took time to find its footing last year took time to find its footing this year you could argue is still trying to find their footing at least defensively on this team, but an offense that in an offense that's loaded with stars, who are you looking to most? Who scares you most on this, this Patriots offense? So this team got so many pass catchers, right? And, and I think the obvious answer would to pick, you know, would be to pick Gronk or, or Mike Evans. I mean, I know, it, you know Antonio Brown, if you were playing, I, well, not, not the, ever. uh, not, not, uh, not Penn State alum, Chris Godwin. I'm not going to go with Chris Godwin either, despite that I'm wearing the sweatshirt right now. I'm actually going with a guy who's been on fire recently and somebody that fits the mold of running backs that Buffalo struggles with, and that's Leonard Fournette. Fournette has been on fire recently. He's, you know, physical. He's a downhill runner, similar to Ramondre Stevenson, similar to Jonathan Taylor, similar to Derrick Henry. And he's been, I mean, that, that run game for, for Tampa has been really clicking recently. I mean, he single-handedly destroyed the Colts, did Fournette. So he's a guy that I'm a little concerned about because, I mean, let's be real. It's been on tape now for a few weeks. Hey, if you line up in those power-heavy sets and run the ball downhill in Buffalo, there could be some success to be had there. And that's kind of how Tampa's offense has been getting it really going recently is through Fournette. He's kind of been that X factor for them. So... For me, you know, I guess regular season Lenny, I don't know what they're calling him now. Uh, I'm a little scared of him, to be honest. I, 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 I'm a little fearful of him right now. How about you? And they're, I mean, well, and they're a team that can really, uh, you know, they're a team that can, that play, that can play that similar running style to New England. You know, that duo man up, you know, running where you're really just attacking the defenders and trying to get to the second level as quick as you can. You know, the Tristan Wirfs, you know, they have a really good line there. Uh, Hobart grad, Ellie Marpet, just a really good, smart line there. But for me, you know, it's, it's the guy who ruined my childhood. It's Tom Brady. He somehow at 44, if the season ended today, he might be the MVP, which hmm. is wild, wild. And he's still going man he, he's uh you know you watch him and and you watch him it's like ah look like is he looking at losing it a little bit he's losing no but he's not the numbers don't say that he still looks as smart and as effective as ever in this offense he's been in every type of situation that you can be in he's the smartest person on any football field he steps on and it kills me to be saying this because god damn it i hate that man with everything inside my body but he's still he's still the greatest quarterback ever to play the game, even at 44 and he's playing just as good as ever. So for me, a little bit of PTSD, it's him. Hard not to pick Brady. Um, I mean, really you could have picked number of guys. Cause this, I mean, this Buccaneers offense, like you said earlier, I mean, they're, they're really loaded. Um, but as we're talking about the Ryan, like the, the bills offense has been struggling for about a good month and a half now. And, they're playing a Tampa Bay defense that has regressed a little bit, in particular that secondary, just a lot of it due to injury. They're just so banged up back there. Uh, I know they've been rolling with all sorts of characters, you know, Richard Sherman. Um, you know, they've had a, they had all sorts of guys in and out of the lineup. 
what is your confidence level as far as like this Bills offense against this Tampa defense? Like, do you think that they could maybe get back on track? Because this is certainly not that same level of defense that Tampa, that, that New England has. Like, where where where? How do you feel about that matchup? I think you. This is a secondary that you can attack, right? If if you want to get Josh back on track in a good in a game that you know Tampa in December should be a good weather game. You know, this is a game where I think you could really do it. You know, Pierre Desaire is playing corner for them, who's someone who I didn't realize until this year was even still in the league. I think, yeah, yeah. Ross Cockrell's playing corner for uh, Buffalo Bills. Yeah, talk, about, talk about that, Ross Cockrell, Buddy Nick, no, uh, Dan Doug Whaley draft pick, Ross Cockrell still kicking around the league, playing legitimate snaps. This is a secondary that I think this team can exploit if they're willing to lean into it, if they're willing to go into this game and say, we just want to throw this ball over the field, running be damned. This is a game where you can do it, especially with, you know, how stout their defensive line is. And, you know, it'll even in pass protection, it'll be tough, but don't give them the chance to stop the run, you know, establish the pass so you can run later on if that's what you really want to do. But, I'm confident because we've seen some teams hang with them. Atlanta hung with them a little bit longer than they probably should have. They got beat by the Saints. Who and the Washington. Bulls, and Washington, right? You you can play ball control with them, right? That the, the Washington had a nine-minute drive in that to end that game. So this is a team that that is not without flaws this year. And this is a team that, you know, that, even with a really good defensive line, if they can, you know, it's really going to start. We say it every week. If you want to beat Josh Allen, it's it's got to be that front. And if they can keep that front at bay, and he, you know, Joe Tryon, JPP, Shaq Barrett, Vita Vea, Dinamican Sue, if they can keep that line at bay, this secondary is primed to be picked on a little bit. I agree with you 100%. I mean, I just wrote it in my notes. Bills have to air it out. This is a game where I think Brian Dable has got to say just F the run game, because especially considering the Tampa Bay right now is your number two run defense in the league behind Baltimore by a single yard as far as fewest yards allowed on the ground. So this is a stout run defense. But like you mentioned, it's a pass defense that struggled. The secondary is so banged up. Then that's how they've gotten beat a lot has been from teams throwing it on them and not necessarily throwing it deep, just throwing it on them and moving the chains and keeping Brady off the field. And I think that is what the Bills are going to have to do. They're going to have to reach back into that 2020 playbook. And this is going to be a game where you got to target digs, I think, at least 10 times in this football game, if not more. I think this is a game where you're going to have to get a lot of guys involved in the past game, really get, you know, get Gabe Davis maybe on the field some more, just create good matchups for your receivers where Allen can you know hit those throws i i think that is how they can move the ball and score points on this tampa bay defense because they if they try to go and establish the run they're going to be in for a long one i I think on sunday because that is the one thing that this bucks defense can do because they do have probably the best front seven in football so i i think they have to they have to air it out in this game yeah and and i think and once again something that they have to get out of the habit of is is beating themselves on offense and they need to get out of this it's it's not this point it's not if it kills them it has killed them they need to not i I said it last i said before the patriots game show don't poop your pants they poop their pants in the patriots game a couple times don't poop your pants because tom brady of all people will make you pay no one makes you pay for mistakes like tom brady they cannot turn it over when in, in in plus territory, they can't turn it over in scoring position. They need to hold on to that football for dear life. They need to they need to just you know lean in like we said it we said it talking about the last game. Lean into what you're good at, man. Like just don't make this game too complicated. Don't make this game more complicated than it has to be. Absolutely. And I think that kind of sort of segues us kind of, kind of perfectly here to, to our last talking point here. And it's our keys to the game. Ryan, what are your three three things the Bills got to do if they want to win this football game on Sunday? I've been saying it every week. I'm going to keep saying it until they finally do it. Get Diggs involved in this game. 
is number one. Force feed him. He is your alpha. Feed him like he is your alpha number one receiver until they can stop it. Keep the defensive line at bay. And keep try keep don't let don't let Tom Brady beat you with a thousand paper cuts. I think you they're gonna have to to if there's anyone who is more built, who's built his career around just being patient, taking what the defense gives him and working his way downfield, it's Tom Brady. Don't let this off don't let their offense beat you with a thousand paper cuts in this game. So for for me, my my three sort of keys this game. I said first of all, you have they have to be more disciplined, right? That's the same thing, like I said, with the mistakes. You got you know they got to quit dropping the ball, quit with the penalties. They're gonna have to, like you said, play very effectively mistake free football because we we as Bills fans have seen it for twenty years. What happens when you make critical mistakes against Tom Brady? It never works out well for you. So that's first and foremost for me. I think number two is that they have to score when they're in the red zone. I know that's sort of like, you know, kind of like a, uh, like a no shit, like moment, obviously. Like, what do you mean? Of course they have to score in the red zone, but, but they have to, they were one of five in the red zone, uh, you know, against, against, or one in four, I believe in the red zone against new England. They've been bad in the red zone all year. When you get down there, you have to score points and you've got to get touchdowns, especially against Tampa Bay and that offense. They need to score when they get down the field. And my last one is, you know, this is, is they got to have to, they're going to have to get to Brady without blitzing because Brady has one of the best quarterbacks against the blitz, like in NFL history. So that, that front four is, you know, Ed Oliver, guys like that in particular, you know, Greg Russo, these guys are going to have to really bring it. I know it's a really good old line, but they're going to have to find a way to get some pressure on the quarterback, especially with no Trey White, because you know that Hyde and Poyer are going to have to be really helping out Dane Jackson against that receiving core. Yeah, and and I think this is a game where be ready to win in a shootout. I think this is a game where Buffalo needs to be comfortable with it being 35-38, 40-41, right? They, they really they need to be willing to go blow for blow. And if they go down and score, you got to go and get it back. And it's just be aggressive. Get back to that aggressive football that we saw last year and just uh, and above all else we, we said it about the punctuate it just don't beat yourself this is a team that can play with anyone in this league when you when you don't beat yourself when they don't beat the when they are when they are playing their football they can play with anyone in this league and that means this tampa bay team so for this tampa bay team what is your score prediction for this game i'm curious about this but i don't think we've ever really we picked the Bills to lose once, I think, this year. Or at least I did. So I'm curious. I think it was a Chiefs game. I think yeah. the Chiefs picked them to lose. I believe. So I'm curious to see if you, if if this may be the second game we pick for them to lose. So, uh, like you said, I've only picked the Bills to lose once this season on the show, um, and the one time I picked it, 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 it was wrong because uh, they destroyed the Chiefs. Uh, this is the second time I'm picking the Bills to lose in this one. I I just think that, similar to what I said going to that Chiefs game, I said I need to see it in order to believe it, right? I need to see this team beat Tom Brady, which they haven't done, mind you, since, what, 2011? Where they where Tom Brady started a game of quarterback and this team beat him. So I'm, I, I have it being a shootout. I have the Bucks winning this one 35-27. I just... Uh, I just think the the Bills are limping into this game, and unless they prove it, they they can prove it to me this game and get my confidence back. But just right now, I just don't think I can pick them going on the road and playing the defending champs and coming out with a win. So I have them losing 35-27. Uh, but I'm curious, Ryan, if you're also joining me, I guess on the dark side. I hope our viewers don't like hate me and want to you know attack me or something here. But Re- reverse psychology, I like it. No, I'm going that too. I th- I think 35-31. I think maybe they need one more come to Jesus game for them to get their shit together here. It'd be nice. I, I once again, this is the team that can, they can play with them. There, there's zero reason they can't, but there's a real sour taste in our all of our mouths right now. And I'm I'm curious on what the dynamic will be in the fan basis because I think this is the first game where people aren't going to be all that confident going into this game either. So I, I hope maybe it's a reverse psychology thing, and maybe we'll come out like. 
the Chiefs game and whoop their butts up and down the field at, at their place. I didn't even think about that stat that we haven't been Tom Brady since 2011. I'm honestly, I, I'm not looking forward to this game because I just, I don't like Tom Brady and I'm not looking, <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it for that fact. I was so happy he was gone. So it definitely one that I hope we can get, but I'm, I'm you know, they say if, if you set, if you set your expectations low, you can never get hurt. Some words of wisdom right there from, from Ryan Sullivan as we sort of wrap up our show here. Uh, as before we go, I'm trying to think about, is there anything we should let our viewers know about? Uh, before we sign off. So shout out to everyone who came in for our live show last yep. week. That was really cool. Uh, Nap will be the live show this week. Uh, th this will drop Wednesday. So tomorrow, if you're listening to this now, uh, if you're listening to this after Thursday, it's on the BF Fanatics YouTube page. Uh, we'll be back live on the Thursday slot on next week for the Panthers week. So, Next week, we will not drop on this time slot. We will drop Friday after a Thursday live show. So if you listen to this still, come see us live. Come watch us live again. Jump in the comments. We had a lot of fun with it last time, actually. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a guest. I haven't figured out who yet. We haven't figured out who yet. And uh, so come join us for another live show. Hopefully it'll be uh, a joyous occasion next week. Absolutely. And as always. Uh, check out all the work going on here at EF on YouTube, on you know your podcast uh, services, wherever you get your podcast from, on the website. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see above our heads where you can get all your articles and analysis there as well. And yeah, that about does it here for the 585 Report. Uh, thank you guys for listening. For Ryan Sullivan, I am Mitch Broder, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.